Welcome to the second part of the Transhumanist Technology series. Today, I want to talk about the shifting boundaries of death, the science behind cryonics, and the new perspective on existence. This video is a continuation of an ongoing series about the scientific basis of transhumanist ideas. If you don't know about transhumanism, you should check out the first part of the series by clicking the I above. One explicit goal of transhumanism is the delay or even abolition of death. But what exactly is death? Contrarily to common belief, death cannot be boiled down to a specific event, and our definition of it has shifted throughout time. Until about 1968, death in most hospitals was defined as the cessation of all vital functions, including respiration and a heartbeat. After, more focus was put on irreversible cessation of brain function, or so-called brain death. Picking a definitive point is not easy. In the end, death is about irreversibility, about being doomed beyond saving. Yet over time, we've learned to bring comatose patients back to life, we intubate against collapsing lungs, we transplant failing organs, and we regularly reanimate hearts which stop beating. As long as our technological and medical capabilities expand, the boundary of what bodily damage spells irreversible doom for us keeps shrinking. This is why cryonicists and others view death not as a singular event, but as a process, a biological decay that starts when the heart and lungs stop delivering oxygen to the brain. The only real endpoint is entropy, when the brain becomes so degraded that no amount of future technology can retrieve the information required to restore its original state. Cryonicists therefore see death as a ticking time bomb where every second counts, and while they cannot defuse that bomb, they have a plan to stop the clock. Many parts of cryonics sound like science fiction dying, being vitrified, stored for potentially centuries in liquid nitrogen for a small shot of being revived by technology not even invented yet. Yet let me make clear that the basic scientific principles underlying cryonics are not only possible, they are already scientifically established. Whether we find them in nature, where animals enter biostasis, or in the laboratory, from cryogenic materials to cryobiology to cryopreservation. We can slow and even stop biological time. In nature, we observe, for example, multiple species of frogs who can freeze solid for days, only to recover and resume life as if nothing happened. We've also brought bacteria who live frozen for 30,000 years in Arctic ice back to life. Freezing is an effective way to drastically slow biological time, but it is also very crude. The biggest danger of freezing is the formation of ice crystals, whose expansion can destroy cells and tissues. Frogs go around this problem by both redistributing organ water and adding glucose or glycerol to their cellular fluid, serving essentially as antifreeze or cryoprotectant, at least for moderately cold temperatures. However, to stop biological decay completely and for a long time, one would need very low temperatures of about a minus 130 degrees Celsius. So cold that cells and even molecules are fixated in place, preventing the loss of information through Brownian motion and what is essentially entropy. This is where vitrification comes into play. Vitrification aims to exchange around 60% of the water in the cells of the body or organ with a cryoprotectant solution that turns into an amorphous glass-like solid at very low temperatures. Cryoprotectants for vitrification vary based on application, but in general they are a mixture of common chemicals and a combination of sugars and salts, amino acids, vitamins and proteins to prevent ice crystal formation as much as possible and maintain the biological viabilities of cells after thawing. Another form of vitrification is using aldehyde-based cryoprotectants, somewhat akin to molecular glue, which fixates molecules by sticking them in place, which is very effective at retaining the structural integrity of the tissue or organ. But it also makes viability after thawing impossible. 
I will come to why one might ever seek such an approach later in this video. Freezing and vitrification are both established and effective ways to stop biological time and we have many examples for both cells and organs recovering after months of storage at very low temperatures. The most important applications for vitrification today are found in reproductive medicine for sperm, oocytes and embryos or in the logistics involving organ transplantations. We know it is possible to store a vitrified embryo for decades if not centuries bringing it back to life by implanting it into an receptive uterus and carrying it to term. The only technical limitation left for cryopreservation is size. The smaller the total number of cells, the easier the exchange of cellular water with cryoprotectant, the better our cryopreservation protocols will work to induce biostasis. For whole human bodies, we might or might not be there yet. But there is little doubt in science that high fidelity, cryopreservation and storage are possible. But what if what makes us us is not stored in our bodies? In our previous video we talked about how transhumanists believe that our body and mind is nothing more but a complicated machine. Therefore, the key scientific question of cryonics today is not whether we can preserve cells and bodies, but whether the totality of information essential to our personhood is located within our body and can thus be preserved with the current technology. This is an especially critical question when it comes to the human brain with its constantly changing electrical signal patterns which will be lost upon vitrification. Let's illustrate the problem with a computer analogy again. If our mind is a continuously evolving software program running on the hardware of our brain, does the sudden switch off and reboot of the hardware lead to critical information loss or do we just start where we left off? We do not know for certain what happens when we interrupt the software, yet we have some experimental proxies to at least hazard a guess. For example, we know that short and partial disruption of the brain's electrochemical activity through anesthesia, stroke or hypoxia leads to loss of consciousness and loss of short-term memory, but not long-term memory. The critical measure for how long our software can be out without permanent damage is determined by neuronal cell death, which can start within minutes after oxygen supply stops. We also know from neuronal biology that long-term memory is physically manifested through protein production and the formation of new synaptic connections whereas short-term and processing memory are not. This suggests that the synaptic architecture of our neuronal network at any given point might encode the more permanent features of our personhood. Lastly, researchers have shown that worms can be vitrified and revived with apparent persistence of long-term memory when it came to odors they learned pre-vitrification. While much more work needs to be done to establish the relationship between information stored in our neuronal architecture and the virtual information that constitutes our personhood, current scientific knowledge allows for the possibility of a software reboot for our mind, as long as the hardware is fully intact. But how exactly do we bring our minds back into the biological machines after our bodies saw? Here we can only speculate. The most straightforward versions suggest a kind of inverse vitrification protocol, slowly thawing and exchanging the cryoprotectant solution with blood-like nutrient solutions, restarting circulation and reanimation and medical care. After all, we do this work for vitrified cells, embryos and even whole organs like kidneys. Given that most cellular damage actually occurs through thawing and reoxygenation rather than freezing itself, the more realistic resuscitation scenarios suggest medical interventions not yet developed which assist cellular repair. High hopes lie within the fields of medical nanorobotics and stem cell research to fix any structural damage to the body that might have occurred during vitrification or thawing. Even more speculative versions include not thawing but scanning approaches, either reinstantiate a biological replica of a frozen body or directly upload the unique brain architecture of the vitrified person into computer software to create a so-called brain emulation. Remember the molecular glue method I mentioned earlier. 
since the main criteria for scanning approaches is not biological viability after thawing, but accuracy of preservation, aldehyde-based cryopreservation protocols might yet turn out to be preferable. A lot more can be said about the science behind brain emulations, which is why we will explore them in a video of their own. Our technological future is however not deterministic. It is very possible that cryonics will never work or never be pursued to the point of making it work. Yet no matter how low one estimates the chances of any of the above approaches bringing us back to life, they are certainly more likely to succeed at keeping the patterns of our personhood in existence than the entropic processes of rotting in a grave or being cremated. All I can say is that we currently have no scientific evidence to claim that cryonic protocols are inconsistent with the physical laws of our universe. Biostasis is not a fictional concept. We have seen it working both in nature and in reproductive medicine for decades. The true question mark surrounding cryonics has never been whether biostasis is achievable or reversible for all body sizes, but whether what makes us human, our virtual personhood, is anchored to physical reality by our brain and encapsulated by the sum total of its synaptic architecture and neuronal activity. This is both a philosophical question and a question science will eventually be able to answer definitively, maybe within our lifetime, certainly within the time of those planning to be vitrified after death. And yet for me, it is this focus on not dying that obscures the true purpose and potential of cryonics. Cryonics should not be about conquering death, but conquering time. Even if you have made peace with the thought that one lifetime is enough for you, even if you don't care about death, cryonics offers a one-way ticket to bring our current self to the future. A future where humans might have colonized distant stars, where space travel can take decades and yet be perceived no longer than the blink of an eye. Given the sheer distances in space, without cryonics, Homo sapiens will never get to explore the stars. Our machines might, our post-human descendants might, but we will not. So let's finally dispense of the idea that the cryonic future is just a fantasy for those who fear the permanence of death. For me, that is the most boring part of it. A cryonic future could be so much more, a place for all who love life or who want to explore the universe or simply hope for better circumstances in a brighter tomorrow. I for one know which future I'd rather find myself in.